Hello and welcome to the Stop Eject Filmmakers Commentary. I'm Neil Oseman, the director. And I'm Sophie Black, the producer and also production designer. And uh, we're actually recording this in Cannes, um, just a few days after the film was finally completed. Under a duvet right now. Uh, under, yes, under a duvet and a collection of cushions. Um, so I shot these at lunchtime, these, these close-ups that I opened the movie with. Um, I didn't really realise how Back to the Future this opening was. It wasn't quite as deliberate as it might appear because anyone who knows me knows Back to the Future is my favourite ever film. But, um, you know, the plan was just to open the movie with shots of junk around the shop. To if you see any uh, green junk at all, that's because I wanted to bring out the colour of the walls, those Art Nouveau walls you see there. Yeah, those tiles were really nice. It's a shame we couldn't see more of them. A lot of them were hidden behind the furniture. Um, yeah, and then Henning added that ticking, the, you know, the ticking watch sounds. Henning Noffel, the sound designer, and of course my company is named Gigawatt Pictures, uh, from 1.21 gigawatts in Back to the Future, and the movie is about time travel. So, yeah, it's quite Back to the Future. Whoops. Oh, here's the alcove, which is made out of old uh, antique and vintage doors, actually. That's my mum's coffee table. We stole that for a few months. <laughs> yeah, and sorry, we scratched it up pretty bad, didn't we? <laughs> it's all right. Very sorry, Sophie's mum. <laughs> and this tape recorder was lent to us by... Uh, David D Bidwell. David Bidwell of the Monster Store in uh, in Nottingham. Yeah. Very kindly. Have you given it back to him yet? Uh, no, Henning's still got it because he recorded uh, sound effects with it. We just steal stuff. <laughs> oh, that's the first glimpse of my calligraphy in the film. And that's my watch. It's actually my watch. Ah, and Katie's hands. My wife, Katie, uh, provides the hands for pretty much every close-up of hands and tape recorders in this movie. That's her finger. Oh. Um, so this alcove was like, we, we had part of it there in the shop, so whenever you see the shop in the background, we are on the shop floor. That's my friend Jack. Oh yeah, um, sorry Jack that we, we cut out the shot of your face, but we felt that... Uh, First visual effect shot there. Yeah, yeah, I did that one. Well done. Quite, quite pleased good. with that no, one. it looks really good. <laughs> um, this foreground is a disco police uh, light that Tommy, the co-writer, went and bought from uh, Maplin for about five quid, and then we put it back in the box after we'd used it and returned it and got our money back. <laughs> we were that cheap on this movie. I can't believe movie. you just admitted that on the commentary. <laughs> nice open and close sign which you made. It's still there in the shop. The shop actually kept it and they use it all the time. So. Yeah. Oh, that was from Dark Side of the Earth, that... Uh, no, that watch was, was actually used in a, a very short film called The Picnic, which, if you're watching the Blu-ray version of this, is actually a bonus feature on this disc. Oh, awesome. Look out for uh, that, then. Also starring Therese Collins um, and uh, Katie, my wife, who was also the costume designer, was very annoyed that we lost this uh, watch. I think the owner the of the shop actually sold it, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he swore he didn't, but... I mean, he did. <laughs> So some people have asked how that shot was done of the watch hanging in midair. Um, it's not CG. We we actually hung the watch on a piece of fishing wire, and then just painted out the uh, a guy called uh, David Robinson, one of the VFX artists, um, did the Old wire school. removal on that shot. <laughs> and this these time lapse things are, um, you know, it is time lapse. We actually That's shot the sequence over the course of about thirty or forty minutes. But the shots of uh, Georgie were done with a leaf blower. I was sort of sat at the bottom of her with a leaf blower on her hair. Yeah, that was a trick I learned on Soul Searcher using a, a leaf blower for the old sci-fi oh, wind Who effects. did that effect? Uh, that was done by Dominic Stevenson. Uh, very nice uh, ghostly effect there. And um, this whole, uh, I love this whole sequence, the way Miguel edited it and uh, Scott's music was really nice. My, a lot of my previous films have a lot of action in, so it's kind of unusual for me that this this is the only action sequence in this whole movie um mm, that is actually quite a good point oh you can see dark side of the earth props in the shop actually if you look carefully yeah the wooden sort there's a big wooden puppet in the shop which is uh, from the dark side of the earth one of my previous projects and the scythe was that from soul searcher the scythe is from soul searcher yeah amazing <laughs> 
Um, so here we've got uh, Therese Collins, who I've worked with on several participatory sort of sex education dramas for schools in the Birmingham area. And she's so serious in this film, and it's so strange to see because every time the camera's off, she's just having us all in fits and giggles. Yeah, she's very funny. Very <laughs> funny. Um, oh, and Belper, my hometown, looking gorgeous. Yeah, this that shot was actually filmed on the recce day about three or four weeks before the main shoot. <laughs> And it was much nicer weather than we actually got during the main <laughs> shoot, actually. Belpa was very much its own character in the film, I think, which is what was so nice about filming in my hometown. Oh, and here we are below the East Mill. Yep, so we're now in the basement of that building. Uh, you just saw the big red brick building. Oh, look at them all. <laughs> I still Sophie's <laughs> favourite scene. I still wake up in sweats just thinking about tape cassettes and how many had to be done. Yeah. Sophie oh. had a lot of work to do. Well, if you've seen Record and Play, you'll know about all the work that went into this. Oh, and everyone said to set up those tapes, so it was a very stressful day that day. Yeah. We are only allowed to be in there for like an hour as well. Oh, that's Katie's hands again. Yeah, <laughs> standing in for Therese this time. She's a little star, Katie. Um, yeah, she is. And this, actually, this scene was, in terms of lighting, was quite heavily planned, but actually I think it turned out being one of the... Uh, less good looking film uh, good looking scenes in the film um, mainly because uh, I didn't check in advance whether we could use a smoke machine uh, whether anyone knew at, at the location how to turn off the, the smoke detector so we could use the smoke machine which would have looked great in that uh, wide shot to really give more depth to the scene but the set's amazing well the location is amazing it's a fantastic it an location old yeah. victorian silk mill and that's actually below ground level and uh, it's, it, it's flooded in the past if we'd filmed there like two years ago it would have like flooded when we went to film so we can't yourself lucky on that one so. yeah yeah and and i think this was perhaps one of the last locations to to sort of come on board Mm, I mean, we wanted it early on, but it took a while to hear if we actually could film in there, so it was very, very much of a relief when we found out. Yeah. Um, so then we're back in the uh, Katie's hands again, but we're back <laughs> in the... Well, the close-ups of Katie's hands were shot in my living room, but... Uh, those were filmed at 5am, those shots, I think. Yeah, <laughs> quite late at night slash early in the morning um, on the <gasps> second floor gardens. of the place. So this was the very first scene we filmed. Oh, yeah, well, wasn't it? Um, I love that uh, close-up of of Kate there, which is, uh, although I physically pressed record on that shot, it was uh, camera operator Rick Goldsmith who composed the shot. And uh, well, Those kids really actually nice. sort, of, sort of won a place in the film, didn't they? Because uh, their school donated to the film. That's right, yeah. They're from um, the uh, Pauline Quirk Academy of uh, Performing Arts in Bridge North in Shropshire. And uh, Julian Elcock, uh, who, who runs the place... Um, contributed to our crowdfunding campaign and then he said um, you know well, I'm running this script competition for my students can I offer the chance to be an extra as uh, as a prize um, and we needed we needed someone for uh, Kate to almost crash into in this scene um, and we, we actually got two two of the students which was great. Well, Georgie actually got told off for riding that bike in the, in the river gardens by the person who monitors it. Oh yeah, there was this guy, this warden, River Gardens warden, who, you know, we had permission to film here. He was kind of weird because he would come up to us and tell us off for doing things, you know, you can't do that, you can't possibly do that. And, you know, it would sound like it was out of the question to do whatever we wanted to do. <laughs> it was also and, my sound kit that Oliver was using for the record. Oh yeah, and then a bit later on he'd come back and say, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had to sell that sound kit to get to Cannes. Yeah. Ooh, montage? Yep, I won't sing the song from uh, Team America because oh, that's what <laughs> someone did uh, on the montage. Oh, that, that shot was done by Chris Newman, the yep. second unit director of photography. And that was filmed outside of Fresh Basil, right? The cafe in... The, the cafe who gave us the bike for the production, yeah. Yep. Which is very nice of them. And uh, some of these shots, if you watch the rough extended version of the deleted scenes on the DVD... You'll see longer versions of uh, a lot of this stuff. You can see more of the set. That's another shot done by Chris Newman. Yeah, with, uh, with snow. superimposed falling <laughs> snow. The, the snow lying was real. The snow falling was actually artificial snow, um, which Colin, the gaffer, and I sprinkled in front of a black drape in my living room, and we superimposed it on. That's one of my favourite shots, that wide shot there. Really? 
Yeah, I'm really pleased with the lighting in it. <laughs> All the sort of practical lights dotted about. Interestingly, the the um, there's some fairy lights right out of by sort of Therese's elbow in the background in this scene, and they were flashing fairy lights. Um, and uh, I only realised when I got to post production that there isn't a tape playing in the recorder at the moment because Kate's in the middle of rewinding one. Therefore, time should be frozen outside of the alcove. So the lights should not be flashing. It's the first time I've noticed that. Actually. So a guy oh. called Matt Collett, who I actually went to school with and who now lives in Peru, bizarrely, um, but who I, I'm in Facebook contact with, um, actually, uh, you know, uh, digitally made those lights not flash using, you know, rotoscoping and stuff. Oh, the proposal scene, the many film proposal scene, this was like a last minute location change because I was flooded and... <laughs> Yes, yeah, we were meant to film this on a weir and, uh, well, the story of that's in record and play, but, you know, I just, this is a lesson really because, you know, I really stuck to my guns about we have, it'll look great if it's on a weir, we have to do it on a weir, but there wasn't any way to do it on a weir because... We had because to film something, didn't we? So yeah. we, were like, we were right next to where the scene where they actually meet, right, right next to the location for that, and this is literally a few yards from there. Yeah, I mean, we really lucked out with the um, with the light here because when we did the two shot, we had the direct uh, harsh sunlight which looks great as an edging backlight to them and sparkles nicely off the water but when we came to do the close-ups the sun had gone behind a cloud because if that that direct sunlight would have been too harsh on their faces in close-up but it you know the cloud softened it perfectly which was very very handy indeed but I, I just wish we'd shot a wide shot at this location as well you know the plan was to intercut it with a wide shot on a weir at some other point um, but it would have been nice to see you know, it would have been nice to have a few more effect shots showing, you know, the two Kates. In well, if you guys time. watch this scene again, you'll see actually quite a lot of Katie, the costume designer, and, and Neil's wife standing in for Kate. Mm, when she's in the background. When going she goes to, to get the, the phone. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Um, these, these sort of wobbly shots of Dan and of Kate and Dan, um, you know, we super, imp like that one, for example, um, we shot all this on a DSLR, you know, a stills camera, and one of the disadvantages of DSLRs is they have this thing called rolling shutter, which means that any fast movement tends to look kind of wobbly, particularly pans and things, because of the way that the, the image is scanned over the course of the 25th of a second that it's recording it. Um, so I, I took advantage of that by deliberately bobbling the camera to, to enhance that effect and also doing something called lens whacking, which is where you take the lens off the camera and just sort of hold it in front of the camera to give an extra sort of wobbly There's in and a dead out of look. Dead butterfly on the window there. Yep. A real dead butterfly. And this room was another great find upstairs in Magpie, the same place it's we shot. a shop shot location. All the interiors, of, apart from the, the basement scene. Um, and this is an actress called Libby Wattis playing old Kate. Um, and uh, we only had one ring. That's a split screen shot because we only we could only afford to buy one ring, even though it was only about the one seven ring. quid off eBay. <laughs> Sorry, <couldn't resist. laughs> um, so we had to do a split screen shot. Uh, and uh, it's a beautiful scene that though. I really like it, particularly the new edit of it. It's wonderful. Yeah, it was quite a challenge to get this to work actually to get the audience to pick up on why she's finally moving on with her life at this point. That's my shoulder. Yeah, and that was filmed like a year after the rest of the movie, wasn't it? Because <laughs> yeah. um, uh, Sophie made this, and you can see it out of focus in this close-up, and you can see it in the wide shot, she made this great polystyrene gravestone, which looked fantastic. To looked more real in real life than it did on camera. Yeah, unfortunately, in full HD in close-up, you could tell that it was made out of polystyrene, so we had to reshoot it against... Again, that Chris Newman did it with you, didn't he? The back oh, of a real that gravestone. That was my cameo. I actually have two cameos, but you can't really see me in the other one. What's the, you're actually a, in the next shot. A person in shop, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, here's the living room, my favourite, look, everyone's favourite set, which yeah. is hardly seen you in the You can film. see a lot more of it in the deleted scenes. <laughs> yeah, so Sophie is in this shot. To sort of, if you look past George's right shoulder between that and the <laughs> curtain, you can see a sort of shape, with a, which is a grey coat. Uh, and that is that is Sophie. Me being person in shop. <laughs> yeah, and that but that was not at all deliberate. She wasn't. I thought she was out of frame, but no, I wasn't looking. We were all working slightly off camera. We were all working very hard to pack away because it was hours before we had to leave, wasn't it? Like That's one right. Yeah, leave, yeah. So. This was our last 
last little bit in the in the shop location really getting everything ready to go and we had to keep doing that while neil was filming yeah and yellow is the color of happiness in this film as you probably noticed got a lot of yellow in the film yeah possibly too much yellow in some of these later scenes (laughs) um and blimey it's the last shot of the movie already that went quickly we've just rambled on loads but great to see matt lock there it is and the song playing now is by andrea Cassina. Yes, uh, who uh, is a friend of George's, and uh, she does a fantastic um, song I painted that anything. sign as well. Cause you did? The person yeah. who was supposed to do it had to go into hospital. Last yeah. tidbit. <laughs> and we actually had to do a, a VFX shot to sort of zoom into it at the end because it wasn't quite close enough in to, to be able to read the, um, you know, grief, uh, help and support during grief and loss. Um Scott Benzie did a wonderful, a wonderful score for it's the movie. So moving. It sounds a lot like Requiem for a Dream in places, and that's why I love it. Oh, who designed the credits? Credits designed by Andy Roberts of Speakers 5. Um, I found him through Worcestershire Film Festival because he did all their graphic design. And uh, initially he designed the photo books, uh, illustrated script books, which were uh, one of the rewards we offered our crowdfunding sponsors. And I, I liked what he did so much with the loops of mangled tape that I asked him to design the credits and do the same thing uh, on those. Um, and he a did family really nice mentioned <laughs> Yeah, yeah, lots of Osmonds uh, <laughs> mentioned, and uh, lots of Sophie's family as well. <laughs> All our lovely locations, test audiences. Oh, Carl Cropley, bless him. Yes, we lost him, rest in peace, him. Carl. Yeah. Oh, here's all our generous funders. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Let's You're let's just finish by people. saying yeah. you are lovely, lovely people. Yeah. Forever quite, in quite our Quite honestly, hearts. this film <laughs> simply would not have been made without you. So um, yeah. you have done a wonderful thing. I all hope of you. you all liked it. So. Yes, really hope you enjoyed it. And thanks once again for getting involved and uh, allowing us to have such a great time making this movie. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.